Hey guys, in this video, I wanna finally give you my in-depth review of the Fuji X-Pro3. If I did any other sort of photography as my main focus, portraiture, landscape, food, studio, architecture, night photography, really any of those and more, I probably wouldn't choose this camera and I can certainly understand why those of you who do focus on those types of disciplines aren't going to have warm feelings toward this camera. This camera is not for you folks and I think we can all agree on that point. But as a documentary street event or wedding photographer, this camera is absolutely top shelf. In this review, I'm not gonna talk about the obvious stuff. I'm gonna try to get past surface level and into some of the nitty gritty aspects of shooting with this camera the way that it was intended. Instead of holding it up to a standard set by the X-T3 as an everyday sort of do everything camera, which is absolutely not what this camera is, I'll be dissecting it from the perspective of a documentarian. And if we're going to review this camera right, the place to start is with the hybrid viewfinder, which is absolutely the centerpiece of this camera. I saw a video a while back from someone complaining that all the early reviews of the X-Pro3, most of the YouTubers and bloggers who received demo copies were mostly done by photographers who would never use the optical viewfinder in the X-Pro3. And I thought this was an incredibly valid point. If so much of the cost, R&D, and love that Fuji puts into this camera is centered around that hybrid viewfinder, I don't feel like it's fair to review the camera without really understanding that feature. This is partially why it's taken me so long to come out with my review. For the past while, I've been focusing on using that OVF, really understanding it, and not just shooting this camera the same way that I would shoot my X-T3. So let's start there with the optical viewfinder. This is first and foremost a feature for a purist. There are a few different people who would appeal to. Certainly someone moving from a DSLR who has trepidation about moving into a mirrorless because they wanna see reality. They don't wanna see their world through a monitor. And it is pretty cool, I think, of an experience seeing the world this way with the OLED frame lines and other useful data on top of the real world. It brings the experience of shooting with a film rangefinder and the power of shooting with a modern mirrorless camera together. And there are two lenses that I use with this feature that I feel like lend themselves well to it. The first, it's not this one, it's the 35 millimeter F2. It's great because it's a short lens and so it doesn't infringe on the optical viewfinder much. It balances well on the X-Pro3, I actually really love seeing the space around the frame, frame lines also with that field of view. Of course, Fuji does offer the sports shooting mode for the EVF and LCD, which will allow you to see past those edges of the frame lines a little bit. So there's no longer that advantage with the optical viewfinder that some people have argued or used as an argument. Um, to support the use of the OVF in the past over the EVF. I also enjoy using the 23mm 1.4 with this body. In fact, that's really the perfect focal length, I think, for the use with optical viewfinder because the frame lines are closest to the edges without going outside the bounds. I'd use a vented lens hood um, with this though so that the hood interferes less with the view. If you manually focus, like I do a lot of times, having that little ERF focus patch, the bottom right is helpful, and that area is covered by the lens anyway, so it's good placement. Fortunately, where the optical viewfinder is concerned, it is less helpful with really wide, really telly, or most zoom lenses. Um, with my 16 millimeter 1.4, for instance, if you get that, you get those arrows um, outside of the frame lines indicating that it's outside of the viewfinder bounds. And really what you're seeing is a parallax of what the lens is seeing anyway. So the framing is gonna be shifted as well as being outside the bounds. So you're, you'd be guessing if you wanna use the 16 millimeter or wider lenses on the X-Pro3. And for me, it's not really an option. With longer telephoto lenses, you have two issues. One is that the lens just covers too much of the viewing area. And two, it's just a really small set of frame lines. With zoom lenses, while the frame lines do update parallax style as you zoom, again, you're going to see too much of that viewing area taken up by that massive lens. So really, the optical viewfinder is more for people who shoot Leica style with smaller rangefinder style primes and more 23 to 35 millimeter lenses. However, the last thing that the optical viewfinder isn't amazing for is adapting lenses. When you use adapted lenses, that optical viewfinder gives you two sets of frame lines that show you the close focus and far focus bounds. So basically the framing will change between those two sets of frame lines depending on where you're focusing, but the X-Pro3 
really has no way of knowing where you're focusing, so it can't update those frame lines for you to use as guides. It's just a little bit too much guesswork for me, and with the focus peaking just being easier and faster um, than that little ERF patch in the corner, I just don't see any real advantage of using optical viewfinder if you adapt. So for me, while I really do enjoy using the optical viewfinder, like I said, with the 23mm and the 35mm primes, it's not a great idea as a photographer to switch methods of shooting based on what types of lenses I'm using. So for me, it's just not practical to use long term. And as far as recommending it, I wouldn't. Photographers who are going to appreciate this the most know who they are already and they're super niche. This optical viewfinder experience is, is too specialized and has too many gotchas, even for an average documentarian. You have to be pretty diehard in a specific set of shooting parameters for this to be a viable shooting style to run with long term, in my opinion. However, there is one other argument that could be made for shooting with OVF over the EVF that not many people talk about. As we all know, these Fuji batteries aren't the highest capacity batteries out there, and um, it's one of the frustrations that many of us have. No one feels that more than an event shooter shooting all day long. It would be nice if we could squeak a few more shots out of each battery. And so I did run a test. I found that on the X-T3, I was able to get 4,373 JPEG shots on the X-T3 on a full charge before it ran out. Whereas on the X-Pro3 in OVF, I was able to get 4,443, so an extra 70 shots. Maybe that's not a significant enough difference to many to really warrant you know, shooting with that style. Um, I did, honestly, personally, I expected that it would save more battery life than it did, but at least now we know. Another slight disappointment for me, the hybrid viewfinder is the centerpiece of the X-Pro3. I would have loved to see higher specs in the EVF to match some of the other really incredible EVFs out there on the market. Now it's nice, don't get me wrong, with that 3.69 million dot resolution and with a fast 100 frame per second refresh. But when you look at who's really killing it out there, it's not a huge surprise to see the Leica SL2, which has a 5.76 million dot EVF. Now that is an extremely expensive full frame camera, maybe not a terribly fair comparison between the two. And I'm not sure if it's a processor limitation by Fuji or an attempt to keep costs down. But if Fuji is going to emphasize that hybrid viewfinder design, I think they got to pull out all the stops, even for the EVF. So if the viewfinder is the centerpiece of this camera, the LCD is marginalized and we see that in the design. Now, no surprise, a large percentage of you do not like this. Um, my wife is with you. Um, most people see it as impractical. Danae calls it the idiot screen. And for a lot of photographers, it is not helpful and the design will potentially hurt more than it will help. Now, Fuji has pretty much stated that the design of this LCD was to encourage the use of the hybrid EVF OVF. This is their attempt to double down on what makes this camera unique and special. Taken in context of a huge expense and pride Fuji has put in this bit of technology, it's no wonder that the LCD screen has been de-emphasized. But people do tend to not like to be told how to shoot and they don't want to have features removed as if Fuji knows better than they how they should be using their cameras. Most of us feel more than a little distrust for cameras Canon's antics when it comes to gimping their gear. And this move on Fuji's part certainly could feel re reminiscent to that. And I can't fault anyone for being upset by that. So I'm not gonna defend that rationale. Maybe it shouldn't be a camera manufacturer's intention to purposefully handicap a camera in the name of imposing a type of shooting style. Although Leica fans may disagree with that. Um, but although I don't agree with the reasons for the design, for me personally, I absolutely love the flip down LCD. And there's several reasons for this. The first is that I don't use the LCD on the X-T3 or very rarely. I prefer to keep my eye on the viewfinder and I don't usually review my event or documentary photos until I'm back at the computer. So having a large, beautiful LCD is not as valuable to the way that I do documentary photography. When I'm in an event or doing street photography, I turn the LCD off because it's a large, unnecessary distraction that needlessly drains my already insufficient Fuji X batteries. Now this is an argument you'll hear a lot. People will say, you can just turn that off, so why impose hiding? On the surface, that sounds like a really good point. However, in practice, I don't like doing that because there are those rare occasions where I do wanna see the LCD, and in those times I prefer to flip the screen down than cycle through a view mode. 
The view mode button is small and it takes a second to cycle through the view modes. I really hate doing it. The other reason I prefer the X-Pro3 LCD design for documentary work is because with the X-T3 LCD turned off, I get nothing on the back and some information is actually useful at a glance, like battery life. So the sub monitor, while certainly not a game changer, it's really nice to have. But what I really love is this texture and the design of the back of the camera. If the LCD is just gonna be off anyway, I'd much prefer to have a grippy, durable texture rather than that scratchable, oily, fingerprinty LCD screen, personally. The next common complaint about the LCD screen is that it only articulates one way. So if you're shooting above your head, it's less helpful. This is an extremely valid point. I've now been shooting with the X-Pro3 nearly daily for the last couple months, and there was one moment where I wanted to shoot above my head and it didn't work out. I had to move the camera forward and get all weird with it, and that was inconvenient. However, I don't know what sort of photography you guys do, but I shoot low and from the hip all the time, certainly far, far more often than I ever shoot up here somewhere. And the X-Pro3 has a strong advantage here over the X-T3. If you look at how much screen real estate you can see when you're shooting low or from the hip, you miss quite a bit with the X-T3. The X-Pro3 will reveal much more of the scene and more information. You can easily see the whole screen and that's a clear advantage I don't hear people talk about much. And as far as the usability, if you're walking down the street and you see something interesting that you need to shoot low or from the hip to capture, the X-T3 is fiddly to get that screen out and down and sometimes I just don't do it and then I don't get the view. I much prefer the single smooth motion to engage hip shooting mode as a documentary photographer on the X-Pro3. So in general, for documentary style photography, the X-Pro3 LCD is not only great, but I much prefer it over the X-T3. However, it's not without its faults. I feel like the sub monitor is not quite there. It's helpful, but it could be more helpful. The fact that it's not backlit is a, is a big deal. Most of the time it's difficult to see it, and especially in times of low light, it's difficult to see your settings at a glance. You have to sort of focus and move around a little bit to catch the light, um, to get some glare. But if this camera was designed for documentarians, low light is a significant part of what we do. Having no backlight was a mistake. Now, I don't want it to be super bright. Again, I don't want eyes to be drawn to me in any way, but it does need just a little bit of backlighting. Otherwise, it might as well be a gimmick or a decoration, as many people say that it is. On the other hand, having a backlight would definitely add to the power consumption. I just wish we had the ability to turn it off or on and change the brightness. Next, again from the documentarian point of view, is the ISO dial. Now, this is my first experience with the X-Pro line. I was waiting for an articulating screen to jump into the X-Pro line. So this will be my first time complaining about the very old ISO design style. But although the ISO dial design is cute, it's not practical for speed, and I would firmly classify it as a gimmick. I wish Fuji wouldn't dogmatically stick to that design. I don't feel like it's practical to use at all. If the design of this camera was to be all about the EVF, OVF hybrid viewfinder, why would a designer create a feature that requires the use of your hand to go up this way um, and, and, you, and require you to take your eye away from the camera to manipulate? This is a complete contradiction in design philosophy. And honestly, to me, it feels a bit patronizing. If this tool was really designed for a documentary or street photographer, you need to be committed to a design throughout the whole camera and not implement features that are clearly there for reasons of nostalgia. But that's totally just my opinion. I know plenty of others who like this design a lot. As it is, like most of you other X-Pro3 shooters, I've mapped the front dial to be ISO, and that works fine. I just wish it wasn't necessary to do so. On the other hand, the exposure compensation dial, it's amazing. I love where it is and how large it is. I've heard people say that they don't shoot with settings which require exposure compensation, so they wish that it wasn't so large. But I dare say maybe this camera isn't for those people. It's going to work best for shooters who appreciate the style of shooting that usually lends itself to an aperture or shutter priority or smart auto ISO mode, and who are on that dial as much as they are resting their thumbs on that thumb grip. Another feature I really love though is the software feature that supports adapting or using third-party manual lenses, um, the mount adapter setting. 
Right now, I have not a small collection of manual focus lenses that I use quite a bit, and I don't even put them on my X-T3 anymore, mostly because of this one feature. I love that I can get the name of the lens in addition to the focal length into that EXIF data. I just wish for two things when it comes to this feature. One is that we need more than, how many does it have? One, two, three, four, five, six, just six. That's, it's nowhere near enough. For us weirdos who adapt a wide variety of lenses and who like to experiment with vintage glass, we need, I don't know, 15 or unlimited. And two, the second thing that I wish for this was that Fuji would kaizen it up. There's no reason not to put this in their other older bodies as well. Please Fuji, just do it. And speaking of features that people who shoot with older bodies want, let's talk about classic negative. I almost don't want to talk about it because everyone seems to love this color profile, but guys, please, please don't hate me for saying that I, I really just don't like it. I shoot a lot of film, and if there's one film that I dislike just about more than any other, um, color negative film that is, it's Fuji Superior. I just can't abide the heavy-handed green cast that haunts the shadows with this film. Shadows are muddy and do not extend to the black far enough. And sure enough, Classic Negative mimics this 2AT. I have been blown away by how accurate this is for simulating Superior. And if you ever enjoyed the look of Superior, you will be astounded by the accuracy here. But I was really hoping we were moving past that muted, faded film malaise of the past 10 years, where wedding photos and portraits and every Instagram photo is afraid to extend all the way to the black, but stick instead with that faded film look that I just can't stand. Guys, this is totally subjective. This is just my review. You shoot the way that makes you happy, but as for me, there's only a few times I think this look works, personally. And it's the same way I feel about when Superior does work. It's when you've got bright sunlight or just a lot of light to work with, not a lot of stuff in the shadows and you overexpose by a stop or two. This look has been popular with street shooters of Fuji Superior and it has a bright and airy look that I've never seen duplicated in digital until now. You absolutely can get this look with Classic Negative. So you overexposing Superior shooters, you can rejoice. You have found the digital equivalent that you've been looking for. Okay, this review is getting long, so let's go rapid fire features that I liked or disliked. Face selection, it's nice, especially if you, like me, like to document your family and have a large family, choosing a face to focus on is extremely valuable. So good job, Fuji, please put it on the X-T3. Minus six EV focus, wow, the 5612 finally can focus decently in the dark, and that is great news for every wedding or event photographer who does shoot in the dark. I guess I can sell my really too expensive Nocton 512. I've been using this for a long time now um, because I didn't trust Fuji to focus in the dark and I would just manual focus with this guy, but not anymore. I've found that, that I now have a new level of reliability on the 5612 with the X-Pro3 in low light, so that's great. Next thing is that it's light. It's lighter than a lot of people think it is. Some people hear titanium and they think that sounds heavy, but it's not. It's not large or heavy and I can hold this all day long with no problems. The only thing to say about it is that it's really hard to grip when you do have a heavy lens on it though. It's a little bit imbalanced and it's, it's not substantial enough to get that big grip. This really was designed for small primes. So if you happen to shoot with the 2.8 zooms as an event photographer, mm, you know, it may not be for you. Where I'm an event photographer who shoots just with primes almost always, this works great though. I wish the buttons protruded just a little bit though. Again, Fuji, you've designed a lovely device that encourages the use of the EVF, so I should be able to navigate all the buttons by feel. Why are these buttons flush with the body? I can't feel the Q menu. That means I have to pull my eye away from the viewfinder to use it. Finally, in regard to the paint, this is purely a personal thing, but I would never go with a Dura-coated version with how much more expensive they are and how much the fingerprints show up. And for me personally, I don't mind a little bit of patina on my camera. I see it as a bit of a badge of honor of how much my camera gets used. You look at my X-T3 and you see a camera well-loved and well-worn. I'm not afraid to let that titanium show through through the years that I'll be shooting with this X-Pro3. So there's a bunch of what I hope were more than surface level thoughts as well as some complex emotions. <laughs> In short, uh, this camera is like a good spouse, boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever. She helps you perform your best. She supports you when things are hard or stressful. She's not perfect, certainly. And there are some things about her that really can drive you crazy. But when you really get to know her and you've been together long enough to finish each other's sentences, you come to appreciate how lucky you are. And I certainly feel that way about my X-Pro3. 
I recommend you give one a try as well. But that's all I got for you for now, guys. Remember, kindness before cameras, and we'll talk to you again real soon.